You know, it almost seems a little bit like a time warp uh, to talk about something you did 15 years ago. Uh, the world has changed a lot since then. Uh, it's an Internet world today. Uh, we have DVDs, which uh, we didn't have uh, back in 1987 when we did this uh, little presentation. Um, at that time, I had two books out. Uh, now got out 12 and working on a 13th one. And I think we're getting into more, some more exciting territory as well. Uh, one of the big changes uh, between then and now is the development of the socionomics area. And uh, that is taking basically what we were teaching back at that time, but putting a more philosophic spin on it and, and essentially saying it's more important than people think. Uh, what's really going on is that the social mood that's making the stock market fluctuate up and down is also causing people to do all sorts of other things. It comes out in social actions, and we're certainly seeing a lot of very dramatic social actions today. And I think they've resulted from the trends that have been in place in, in recent years. Um, the stock market has probably finished its great wave five uh, from the uh, 1974 low and, and even from the 1932 low. That's certainly something that uh, we couldn't have said back in 1987 when we were uh, doing this video. This was our fifth major seminar. Uh, we had already had four of them under our belt. Uh, you can tell, I think, that it's pretty polished at this point. We put a lot of effort into designing it in the first place, but doing it a few times really helps. I don't think there's a wasted minute on this thing. I think the quality of information is still the best that you can get uh, anywhere. There have probably been one or two books written since then and, and a few people offering tutorials, but nothing new. Uh, let's face it, R.N. Elliott was a genius to have discovered what he did to have discerned the patterns uh, that are in the stock market. And as yet, uh, we haven't had anybody come along and say, well, here's some nuances, and if you really apply yourself, you can see that the market's uh, got an extra pattern or maybe doing something different from what Elliot said. So uh, genius like that comes very rarely, and I think we're fortunate that we can uh, teach something that a man like that discovered uh, back in the era before computers, before the Internet, and before DVD. It may uh, surprise you to know that a small company like ours at the time spent $100,000 just producing this video. We had a real-time truck outside. And we had three different cameras in the room. We had all kinds of uh, personnel involved in producing this thing. And there was a lot of post-production because we didn't want to have you know, extra time-wasting stuff on these videos. We wanted to make sure that every minute counted. And I think when you see it, uh, you'll, you'll see that it does. And to bring it back to the beginning, I think that one of the wonderful things we have today is, is DVD technology because that allows us to show off all the hard work we did back in 1987 and uh, bring this uh, series of seminars to you on a format that's fun, easy, and shows off all the good quality that's there. Welcome. This, uh, to a great degree, I think is a, an historic event. The last time there was a series of uh, Elliott Wave uh, seminars was 20 years ago in Chicago. Uh, this wraps up our series in Atlanta. It's our fifth one in two years, so I'm, I'm glad you could make it. I think, uh, in fact, you probably are uh, among the most fortunate group because uh, we've actually added one or two items uh, during the two years. So. We're going to cover absolutely everything uh, we can tell you about the wave principle. Did anybody hear the alarm go off a little while ago? It was really loud. Uh, Lou Rukeyser tried to get in through the back door. <laughs> I think we're going to have a lot of fun over the next two days. <clears throat> now, does everyone have this workbook? Make sure you've got it. If you don't, raise your hand and someone will take care of you. Good. I want to stress one thing. We didn't call it a manual, so it is not full of all the information you need to know. This is a workbook. It's something for you to write on, uh, to take notes on, to work with. Uh, when you combine it with the Elliott Wave Principle Book and the Precision Ratio Compass Manual, uh, that combination will give you all the information you need. We've got a lot of information to cover in just a couple of hours, so I want to get straight to work. The most important thing to realize at the very beginning of any study about the market is not, at least right away, 
what methods you should be following, but what approaches you should not be following. Those approaches are the ones that the crowd is paying attention to, and the crowd is usually wrong. Uh, the most important uh, area of information to ignore is the daily news. It's meant to throw you off. The other important area involves the popular points of focus on data outside the market, which are assumed to impact the market. Uh, does anyone here not remember the incredible hand-wringing that people used to go through a couple of years ago over the weekly money supply figures, as reported? People would wait with, with bated breath. They'd be afraid to be in a futures contract because that money supply figure was coming out. It got to be such an intense focus that they switched the reporting time from Friday after the close to Thursday after the close because people couldn't stand going all weekend knowing that the market was going to open way up or down on Monday. Well, it took a while, but eventually people realized that that money supply figure, as crucial as they were convinced it was uh, for so many months, actually had very little to do with where the market would be the next day, the next week, the next month, or certainly the next year. There was also a period in 1985 and 1986 when uh, it was observed that every single movement in the stock market was preceded by a movement in the bond market. So people began to focus very closely on every single move in the bond market. Every little ticket was making, literally, the traders were saying, oh, the bonds are up three ticks now, it's time for stocks to rally a point and a half. Well, that faded away around 1986, and people began to see those trends diverge, and those who had bet on the continuation uh, of that correlation ended up losing money. Everything that looks good from the sidelines like that for a short period of time usually ends up not working. For a while, there was also an argument that the movement of oil prices determined the movement of stock prices. Uh, one of the issues I put out, I think it was about two years ago, uh, showed two headlines from the very same newspaper. Uh, one was on Tuesday, and it said, stock market uh, plummets as oil collapses. And the Friday's headline said, stock markets rally on declining oil prices. Uh, obviously, the first argument was, if oil prices go down too hard, that's bad for oil stocks, which is bad for uh, the entire market. And the next argument was, if oil goes down, that's good for the economy. There's always an argument that sounds plausible when it comes to taking an event outside the market and claiming that it is going to affect the market. Getting closer to the present, I'm sure you remember the, the incredible focus in 1987 on the movement of the U.S. dollar. Everybody said, this is the key. Forget oil, forget bonds, forget everything else. It's the movement of the U.S. dollar that's going to tell us where stocks are going. Well, that's begun to fade uh, very recently, although still seemingly important to people uh, are the trade figures. In other words, the balance uh, of our exports to imports. People are still quite convinced that this is a big key to where the stock market is going not necessarily that day, but certainly over the next week, month, or year. As a matter of fact, the Wall Street Journal uh, described it as a frenzied focus on this monthly trade figure. Well, every time I see one of these uh, contentions by someone that an outside market event is going to affect the movement of the market, I very quickly just try to decide whether that is valid. And the quickest way to make that decision is to look at a chart of the data and compare it to a chart of the stock market. Hey, if there's a perfect correlation, I'll add that to my group of indicators. But you know what? So far, I haven't found one. In fact, I think most of the time, this kind of information plays the role of a hook, something to get people thinking the wrong way when they should be thinking the other way. Let's take a look at one example. Recognize that chart? <clears throat> These are the monthly trade figures. Now, let's suppose that uh, back in 1982, which is right in here, you were sitting in your office, and the devil came to you all of a sudden, and he said, Psst, hey, I, I got something for you. Now, look, in exchange for your soul, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to give you the monthly trade figures for the next five years. Now, I think most people are pretty reasonable. They probably wouldn't make that deal, but uh, you might be tempted because, after all, the newspapers told you that the trade figures were the key to where stocks are going. Well, let's suppose somebody, not among this audience, of course, decides that he's going to make this bargain. He wants to make his name on Wall Street, and if he has this information, he knows he's going to get rich. So the devil comes up and reveals the figures for the next five years. And as you can see on that chart, not only are there deficits throughout the period, but they are increasing. And the economists have told us that trade deficits are bad. They're bad for the economy and bad for stocks. Well, of course, we all know the history now. As the trade deficit continued to widen and the hand-wringing continued about how it was going to kill the stock market, into record figures the trade deficit plummeted, and yet the stock market kept going up. Not only was it going up or just holding its own, but it was in the best bull market since the 1950s. So the trade deficit figure was a hook. Now, you may have noticed recently the people reporting that the trade deficit figures have been improving. Now, people are supposed to be convinced because of that information that stocks are a buy. Is that true? Well, rather than say that there's an inverse correlation here from what people believe to be true, my answer is this kind of number is just plain irrelevant. Don't use them. They will not help you make money, and they will often help you lose it. Now, there's another aspect to the market that a lot of people feel uh, changes things every 10 years or so, and that is an improvement or a change in technology or market mechanics. Modern communications, people cite, as one reason why the stock market is different today from the way it was 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 100 years ago. Instant information uh, by teletype, by satellite, uh, by quote machine, has that changed things? People say, well, the market's different today. You can't compare it with the 30s or the 50s. We have an institutional dominance now. The public is not the main owner. Institutions are. And we all know that those institutional money managers are really savvy guys, not like the public. They wouldn't make mistakes in the market. So they control it, and therefore it's different. Options came about in the 70s, and um, people said, oh, now this is going to affect and change the way the market behaves. The tail is going to wag the dog, and options are going to have a lot to do with where prices go. And, of course, then index futures came along, and that, I think, has probably had the biggest uh, focus as far as those people arguing that the market is different today from the way it was any time in the past. We have futures contracts on stock indexes. We have institutions getting very sophisticated using computer models to buy baskets of stocks and sell baskets of stocks. They call this program trading. It has gotten to be such a frenzy, this focus on program trading and what it may or may not have done to the market, that congressional uh, committees are looking into the effects of program trading on the stock market. Now, <clears throat> I usually ask a question uh, among people just to get a feel. I know there's a lot of argument these days about whether program trading and computerized trading and portfolio insurance have affected the movement of the market. Uh, some people say, for instance, that the 1987 stock market crash would not have occurred if we didn't have program trading. Others say, well, maybe we would have had a decline, but it would have taken a lot longer uh, or maybe not gone as far uh, without those computers. So just to get uh, a show of hands here, I'd like to ask people whether or not you think a ban on program trading would have alleviated this crash. Let's, let's see a show of hands of those people who think it would have. All right. Are you just uh, worried, or is this a sophisticated group? <laughs> now, you know my bias, I'm afraid. But you know what? There's an objective answer to this question anyway. Because this is not a picture of 1987, that's 1929. So the answer is no. <laughs> program trading, uh, a ban on program trading wouldn't have had any effect. They didn't have computers back then. Now, I could just as well have put a chart up here with a big label on it saying 1987. 
and still said there's an objective answer to, to this because this is a chart of one of the crashes in the foreign markets, most of which, without computerized trading, went down a little bit further than the United States went down. I do not believe, and Elliot did not believe, that mechanical differences change the movement of the stock market one iota. The basic theme that he kept repeating is that there is only one major determinant of the movements in the market, and that is the direction and change of mass psychological mood. That people are people, they have been, and they will continue to be. And the charts prove that because the patterns repeat again and again and again on the short term, intermediate term, long term, across markets, regardless of whether you're looking at stocks, bonds, gold, or pork bellies, you see the same patterns over and over again. Therefore, he decided that what he was really looking at was something much more basic than a list of prices responding to the daily news, or even some of the major fundamental events going on, the social events, the political events. He said there must be something just inherent in mankind that makes them behave the same way over and over again when they are part of a crowd whose members are betting on the movement of prices in a particular market. And the next two days, we're going to try to communicate what that nature is. If you could distill most of R. N. Eliot's observations on one chart That is the picture you would see. Anytime prices in a market are moving in the same direction as the one larger trend, they will take this path. Simply, Elliot described it as the five-wave pattern. Now, I'm going to go through this step by step, just to show you exactly how psychology develops in this five-wave pattern. Then we're going to look at some real-life charts and see how well Eliot's concept is reflected in those charts. Every movement upward or downward, which is in the direction of the one larger trend, has to start from a point which is ending a previous pattern. Let's look at the bull market situation right now. Every movement of major degree starts at a bottom of a bear market. Let's assume a bear market has ended right at this point where the word bottom is. What is the development of psychology from that point? Well, from a major bottom, which, by which I mean a low which is going to lead to many years or even decades of price advance, usually the market will have associated with it some extremely bad news. Negative fundamental environment. If you're dealing with the stock market, you, you've usually uh, got a depression or deep recession in force. There is usually an argument among market watchers about whether that market will survive whether it will continue to exist, and that's true whether you're talking about the stock market, the sugar market, or anything else that people are trading. At intermediate lows, very often there will be the same type of negative environment, but to a lesser degree. Uh, a recession, a mild recession perhaps. Uh, perhaps uh, limited uh, wars or skirmishes whereas those major lows are often associated with major wars, the intermediate lows, something of a smaller scale. And of course, then, there's the short-term low. Very often, you just get an overnight piece of bad news that'll correspond with a short-term bottom, and sometimes none at all. It's just the natural play of psychology giving you a short-term low in a market. From this point, wave one begins. This is going to start off the change in psychology from extreme pessimism at the bottom 
to extreme optimism at the top. Eliot's most important observation is that the crowd does not move from extreme pessimism to optimism in a random fashion. It doesn't get there in a straight line. It does it through a series of psychological stages. The first stage he simply labeled wave one. This is a rebound from the depressed levels at the actual bottom. It's a recognition of survival by the market, a realization that the worst has passed. Now, most participants don't necessarily understand that to be true, but the market is reflecting that by making its first wave up. Wave two, then, is a partial retracement of wave one. It's a severe test of the conditions that existed at the actual bottom. Sometimes, when you look at those fundamental background uh, uh, events or situations, some people can actually argue that, that the uh, fundamentals are worse, or at least as bad as they were at the actual price low. And yet, prices hold above the prior low. This wave one, two pattern forms a base. This is the launching pad for wave three. Wave three is usually, particularly in the stock market, the longest, strongest, and broadest move in a sequence. It's usually the longest in terms of time and price movement. It's the strongest in terms of the uh, rate of change on the upside. And it's often the broadest, particularly relative to wave five. And by that, I mean in terms of the advanced decline figures. More stocks will be moving up relative to moving down in wave three than they will be in wave five. As wave three progresses, psychology begins to change. You see, the average investor is two steps behind the market. Don't forget, this progression started with a bear market low. Most people were petrified by the end of that bear market that it was going to continue. When wave one occurred, a lot of market watchers said, don't believe it. This is a rally in the previous bear market. It's a trap. When wave two gets underway, people say, OK, the old bear market has resumed. Now, there are a lot of ways that you can verify this observation. It's not just an assertion. Uh, if you keep technical indicators of market sentiment or psychology, you'll find that the, at the bottom of wave two, sentiment reflects a very powerful pessimism. Sometimes I have seen that pessimism be greater than the pessimism which occurred at the actual low. Once wave three begins, however, this starts to change. Early in wave three, people are still holding on to the idea that it may merely be a rally in the previous bear market. As wave three progresses, there is a center point where the acceleration is the strongest. I call that the point of recognition. It's when most people in the market finally decide that the major trend is now up. There is no question about it. On those days or weeks or months, you will see extreme volume very powerful breadth, breakout type activity. Psychology continues to change as wave three progresses. By this point, people are pretty optimistic about the future. You see, they've changed their minds. The major trend is no longer down, it's up. Well, by this point, they're probably, uh, you see in the center of wave three, they've uh, covered all their short sales at that point of recognition. By about here, they're 50% invested. Somewhere along here, they may approach 100% invested. Right about there, they're buying options on their positions. And right here, they're buying futures contracts as well. And just after the top, if they're really bold because they're assuming this is a pullback in the uptrend, they're buying options on the futures. <laughs> well, that's why wave four is labeled a surprising disappointment. Wave four is a normal retracement. As you can see from this graph, wave three, if it's usually the longest wave, has traveled a long way, and a correction is long overdue. A correction is exactly what the doctor ordered. The market gets it. But you see, because of the extreme optimism that was generated by this wave, the fact that people finally moved from underinvested to overinvested at the top 
sets them up for a disappointment and probably even for a net loss on their positions. Once wave four is over, wave five begins. Wave five is the final movement in psychology toward the upside. As wave five begins, people regain their confidence. They say, well, we made a decision during wave three that the long-term trend is up, and this movement to new highs is confirming that conviction. We have no problems with this basic market. We can get invested again. We can be comfortable. Of course, wave five takes you into the final high, and wave five precedes the largest correction since the entire sequence began. Now, the fifth wave is obviously the most important one to recognize in the entire sequence because it's going to alert you to the fact that the biggest correction, if it's a smaller degree, or bear market, if it's a larger degree, since that five-wave sequence started is about to occur. Fortunately, the fifth wave is the easiest wave to recognize from two different aspects. There's a technical aspect and a fundamental aspect. From a technical point of view, the fifth wave is virtually always weaker than the third in just about every measurement. It doesn't have to be shorter than wave three, but if you analyze the technical development of wave five in terms of speed of price movement and probably most important, the participation of stocks, you will find that it is weaker than wave three. Breadth begins to thin in wave five. I found this true not only in fifth waves that last a year, but in fifth waves that last a day and a half. If you compare them to the power of wave three, you will find that the advanced decline participation is not as strong. That's probably the biggest technical key to identifying a fifth wave. Usually, particularly on smaller degrees, intermediate and lower, volume will also be less in a fifth wave. There's less power there. People got heavily invested in the third wave, and they haven't got that much buying power left. And it shows up in the technical condition of a fifth wave. The second area is the fundamental area. In virtually every case, you'll find that a fifth wave has problems behind it that the third wave did not. Now, keep in mind that a fifth wave follows wave four, and wave four is a correction. And usually, the fundamental news background during a fourth wave is pretty bad. It's gone from the positive background that wave three finally generated to a weaker, scarier background that gets people out at the correction low of wave four. So the fifth wave does show an improvement relative to the fourth wave. And that gets people very optimistic. They say, look, things are getting better. But if they stepped back and observed the chart, and then said, now let's go over in our minds what the fundamental conditions were in wave three and compare those to what's happening today, they would have to respond that today's fundamental situation is not as strong as it was in wave three. And that is another very strong indication that wave five indeed is in. Now, do you know that in the entire wave principle, there are only three rules that you have to follow? Now, the reason it's important to stress the rules and remember them is that most people don't. And if you read a lot of armchair Elliott uh, interpretation, by that I mean a chart with letters and numbers on it that don't necessarily correspond to what R and Elliott suggested, you will find that these rules are broken by a lot of practitioners. And that's one reason why some practitioners find they're wrong. The rules are there for a reason. They describe the real way that prices behave. And if you try to say, this time it's different, this time I'm going to throw <laughs> away the rules because my opinion comes first, you are going to end up making mistakes. What Elliot did, above all, was to describe reality in the marketplace. It's a somewhat complicated uh, discussion once it's all over. It's going to take us two full days to cover every aspect, but it's important. Rather than just having a black box indicator that says, well, here's one aspect of the market, and we'll use this to make our decisions, what, you're, what we're going to try to understand is the entire reality of the way prices are moving. Here are the three rules. If you write them down, and if you don't break them, you will be better than most people who dabble in this approach. 
The first one has to do with the second wave. Wave two cannot go to a new price low. It can retrace up to 100%, but it can't go to a new low. Second waves can also occur as rallies, and then they can't go to a new high. The basic summary is that a wave two cannot move beyond the start of wave one. The next rule applies to wave three. Wave three can never be the shortest wave. Now, that is not to say it must be the longest. It merely can never be the shortest wave among waves one, three, and five. So-called impulse waves, one, three, and five. Wave three will never be the shortest of those three waves in terms of price movement. The third rule has to do with wave four. Elliot observed that a fourth wave never ends in the price territory of wave one. A fourth wave never ends in the price territory of wave one in the classic five wave sequence. You can summarize that by calling it the non-overlap rule. And on this picture, in a bull market, it merely means that wave four cannot fall into the price territory of wave one. It cannot come down and overlap the peak of wave one in terms of price. From here, we're going to take one big step forward. This concept is central to the wave principle. Let's suppose that this chart we're looking at right now is a yearly chart of stock prices over several decades. And you see a very clear five-wave structure, but curiosity strikes you. And you say, I wonder how each of these five waves subdivides. Well, Elliot had that curiosity, and he looked very hard to make uh, his conclusion. And he discovered something very interesting. Wave one, if, if he looked at the subdivisions, took a five-wave upward shape. In other words, if you took wave one on your yearly chart here and made a weekly chart showing only the subdivisions of wave one and blew it up on the chart so you could see the subdivisions clearly, you would see exactly this picture. Now follow it through with me because the psychology is just the same. Remember, we had a major low here. Coming off that low is wave one the recognition of survival. Wave two, the pullback that people think is part of the previous bear market. Wave three, the strong middle portion. Wave four, the pullback. And wave five, right into the peak. What happens after wave five? The largest correction since the sequence began. And that five wave movement becomes a building block for the next larger five wave movement. All right, what about wave three? The answer is, if you looked at a subdivision of wave three, you should see, essentially, this picture again. The same thing is true of wave five. Subdivides into five waves right into the peak. These are called impulse waves. And remember at the outset I mentioned that five wave structures such as this are how the market breaks down when it is moving in the direction of the one larger trend. In this case, the one larger trend is up, and therefore, the waves moving upward of one smaller degree will take the five wave shape. Now, how do waves two and four subdivide? Waves two and four are moving against the trend. They're not going with the trend of one, of one larger degree. They're moving against it. Well, a couple of things happen. First of all, Instead of moving with the underlying tide, they're moving against it. And therefore, they never are allowed to develop the full five waves of psychology in the opposite direction. There's too much underlying pressure keeping that market from giving you a five wave structure in a counter trend move. There are no one, two, three, four, five structures which are complete counter trend moves or corrections. 
The second thing that happens is, since there are various strengths in the advancing phases for the correction to work against, there are various ways that the market can create a correction. So not only <clears throat> do you not see a five-wave structure, you see a lot more variety in corrections. Bull markets tend to be a lot easier than corrections because there is only one major shape, we just saw it, the five-wave structure, when it's moving in the direction of the one larger bull market. But moving against the trend, you see something different. You see different ways that the market can subdivide or create a corrective pattern. Now, we're not going to go into all the details right now about what these corrective patterns look like. There are 10 different corrective patterns, and we're going to cover those this afternoon when we get into the real nuts and bolts of things. But I want you to understand that when we start looking at these real-time pictures, you won't be seeing one, two, three, four, fives against the trend that look like the five-wave structure we just studied. Corrections are a variation on the three-wave theme. Elliot labeled them A, B, C. Sometimes they'll have a rally in between and give you another ABC, but there's a repetition of the three-wave theme instead of the five. If this is the standard shape of a bull market, which is moving in the direction of the larger trend, you will now understand why I published this chart in November 1982 in the Elliott Wave Theorist. The market from the depression lows of 1932, a bottom which followed an 89% collapse in stock prices, was developing in the classic five-wave structure that R.N. Elliott described. We had seen a first wave up, a second wave pullback, a long third wave in the middle, a fourth wave correction, and A.J. Frost and I were making the case that we needed, we required, because of the typical movement of psychology, a fifth wave to great new heights. Not 1,000 on the Dow or 1,200 on the Dow, but something close to 3,000. <clears> Let's see how that worked out. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, on a monthly basis going back to the early 1920s. Here you can see this terrific bear market collapse in stock prices from 1929 to 1932. Now let's see how this sequence reflects the five-wave development that we discussed earlier. Of course, this low occurred amidst a good deal of fear, a good deal of worry, arguments that perhaps this market was not going to survive. There was definitely a question of survival. Some people were saying the market, bear market is not over. It's going much lower. The founding fathers made a big mistake a long time ago. They set this thing up in such a way that it can't continue to work. People were beginning to cast their eyes to Europe and study some of the fascist models being developed over there and saying maybe we should change our, our way of government and so forth. Good deal of fear. We were in the worst or entering the worst period of uh, economic depression in the memory of everyone living at the time. It was later described or labeled the Great Depression. Plenty of things to worry about. Lots of reasons for people to say we shouldn't be buying this market. There are too many things to worry about. Of course, if you study the history of markets, this is the kind of environment that creates the low, and it's exactly when you should be buying. Let's see what's happened from this point forward. From 1932 to 1937 was a first wave up. A lot of it occurred during the period that was described as the Great Depression. It was a recognition by the market, however, that it was going to survive the terrible conditions that existed at that low. In fact, few people realize that this amount of price movement, almost a five times multiple in less than five years, is the best 
upward movement of this century in terms of percentage gain over time. When it was over, though, it ended with a bang. Now remember, when wave two gets underway, most people are still quite convinced that that old bear market may still be alive. It brought us into the low. There was a good deal of skepticism on this advance. And notice that right off the 1937 high, the market started down in a crashing mode. And people said, here we go again. It's 1929, all over. We're going to new lows. There was a great deal to worry about from a psychological standpoint. And of course, when the market came down and broke the prior low, there was more worry. What about the fundamental situation? Remember, wave two usually gives you a severe test of the same style of worry that the actual bottom had. What was happening in 1942 as the stock market was making its low? Well, the United States was involved in World War II. And in fact, at that particular time, there was a good deal of thought that uh, the Allies were on their way to losing the war. Now, again, the stage was set for a good deal of fear about the very question of survival of that market, for a different reason this time, but an equal amount of worry and concern that the market was going to survive. This created a base pattern from which this powerful third wave began. It started in 1942, lasted 24 years, all the way into a peak in 1966. As is classic psychology changed right along with it, very slowly at first, people don't get excited at the beginning, they merely get less worried. But that is on the way toward a very good feeling, which is finally achieved at the high. First thing that happened, as fundamentals begin to support the wave three movement, was that the war started to improve for the Allies. In this period, the Allies won the war. We got into the late 1940s. And the post-war depression that so many economists were predicting didn't happen. You had more good news, or at least less bad news. From there, the market began to go a little higher into the early 50s. Prosperity began to return. Global peace was pretty much at hand. Prosperity got better and better as the 50s went along, and people went from one-car families to two-car garages. <clears throat> we got into the early 60s, finally into the mid-60s, and that's when the euphoria really began to show. In fact, if you remember back to that time, we decided that things were going so well for the United States that we were the economic and military rulers of the world, essentially, that we could afford both guns and butter and create something called the Great Society. You don't see that kind of legislation at a major bottom. You see it at a major top, a celebration of how wonderful things are and how we can do anything we want to do, we can afford to do anything we want to do, a classic signal of a major top. As we got into the mid-60s, the euphoria was evident in all kinds of ways. But certainly on Wall Street, it was very difficult to find an analyst anywhere who was very bearish on the outlook for stock prices. There is at least one who was. His name was Charles J. Collins. He was the man who, back in 1938, brought R. N. Eliot to Wall Street in the first place. He was the man that Eliot wrote to and said, I have a discovery. I'd like you to look at it. He looked at it. He was convinced it was valuable, and he set Eliot up in an office. He was also an excellent practitioner of the wave principle himself. Hamilton Bolton, after Eliot's death, had carried on uh, with the analysis of the stock market, and he was publishing a supplement to his publication, The Bank Credit Analyst. At that time, he had to be out of the country, and he asked Charles Collins if he would mind writing the supplement that year. It was 1966. He spoke to him in uh, January. The market peaked in February. Collins wrote his report in March. It was published in April, right here. And Collins said very clearly, we are in for a bear market. The sequence, which began in 1942, is now ended. 
It has subdivided into five waves according to Elliott's rules, and that means we're going to start the biggest bear market since back here in 1937 to 1942. He said, I think it's going to last 10 years and probably carry into the 500s. As I said, he was one of the very few bears on Wall Street at the time. In some ways, Mr. Collins was actually a bit optimistic. The bear market did carry into the 500s, but in terms of the price pattern and the inflation-adjusted value for the Dow Industrial Average, it actually lasted 16 long years into 1982. Well, 1974 marked the price low at 572.20. 1982 marked the end of a sideways corrective pattern under the wave principle, and from that point we launched wave five. First, let's figure out whether wave four follows the typical idea of a fourth wave under Elliott. Remember, we described it as a surprising disappointment. There were plenty of surprising disappointments throughout this period. There was more inflation than people expected. We were involved in a war that most people didn't like. It was unpopular. Eventually, we lost the war, or at least withdrew, with many people believing we had lost it. There was a president in office who had to resign in disgrace from a scandal. Shortly thereafter, inflation picked up again to even higher levels. We had another president who was widely considered one of the most inept in the history of the United States. And year after year during this period, people were saying to themselves, how can we be doing this? We're the United States of America. This is ridiculous. They were disappointed year after year, and their stock prices were eroding and reflecting that problem. You see, they had finally come to the realization in about 1964 that we truly were in a bull market that was not going to stop. And they were very disappointed when they discovered that that conclusion was wrong, that we were in a bear market. The disappointment finally ended with the recession of 1981. We just had a new president in office. People felt that his economic policies would change things, and immediately we got a recession. That was another disappointment, but it was the last one of the sequence. From that point forward, starting in August of 1982, the stock market blasted off. Its initial liftoff was so strong, it was the fastest rate of change on the S&P 500 in 40 years. To be precise, the strongest since right here. The last time an upward movement of this degree began. Well, the 80s have provided a wonderful bull market. The percentage advance from 1974 to the 1987 high was the same as we saw from 1932 to 1937. It just took several years longer than that period did. Now, the biggest question that we face today is, is the 1980s bull market typical of a fifth wave? Now, we've already discussed the ways that we would just make that decision. One is technical, one is fundamental. The first question. Is the 1980s bull market as technically strong as the bull market of the 1950s? Well, I'll tell you, the answer is it ain't even close. From 1942 to 1966, you could almost throw a dart at the Wall Street Journal and pick a stock which ultimately was going to go up. Let me show you the difference in the advanced decline figures from Roman numeral wave three which is our 24-year wave three advance, and in Roman numeral wave five. That's a picture of the cumulative advanced decline line. And it shows the incredible power in the market in terms of breadth from the 1942 liftoff. This is a plot of the number of stocks which on a daily basis are going up minus those that are going down. The plurality was terrific as wave three took off. That plurality remained incredibly powerful as we moved into the late 1950s and began to wane when we finally got into the fifth wave of the third wave in the early 60s. Now, I must point out that the construction of this chart is not the best that could be done. 
There are more stocks traded on the New York Stock Exchange every year, and this is merely a difference. It really should be done on a percentage basis. But if anything, it merely points out the incredible weakness of the 1980s bull market. We have more stocks, and yet if you subtract the downs from the ups every single day, you find that this is the kind of performance we have seen since the 1974 low. I'd also like to point out another little thing. On the previous chart, we saw uh, wave four from 1966 to 1982. It looked pretty mild, really, a sideways consolidation, essentially. This is what happened to breadth during that period. An absolute collapse in the 1974, a rebound, and nearly a double bottom in 1982. Elliott was one of the few to recognize that a sideways pattern is a correction. And the internal statistics, such as the advanced decline figures, bear that out. Well, from 1982, this is the net progress of the advanced decline line. In other words, it has been very difficult in the 1980s to pick a stock that was going to go up with the bull market. It wasn't a given that if you chose any old stock that it would follow prices up. This is classic fifth wave behavior. What about the fundamental background of wave five? I think we would all agree that the fundamentals or the economics surrounding the market in the 1980s has improved relative to the 1970s. The inflation rate has receded. Interest rates are down from 16 percent uh, closer to 6, 7, 8 percent, depending on the instrument you're watching. Uh, we're not involved in a war anymore. So people can look around and say, okay, things are generally better now than they were in the 70s, but remember, the key is not to compare the fundamentals of the 80s with the 70s, but the fundamentals of the 80s with those of wave three, most of which occurred in the 1950s and going into the early 1960s. Can we really say that the fundamental background today is better than it was during that period? We currently have a 7% interest rate. Back then, rates were between 2 and 4% throughout that entire bull market period. We've had, as people have pointed out many times, a trade deficit that is setting records every month. It's a problem. It doesn't determine where the market's going, but it's a fundamental event that's in the background. It's not as healthy as what we experienced in the 1950s and early 60s. What about the federal debt. Back in that prior time during wave three, it really wasn't much of a problem. Of course, as we entered wave four, and still as we are in wave five, the federal debt sets records year after year. What about the global debt situation? How many countries were in trouble with their debt back in the 50s and early 60s? Very few relative to today in the 1980s. So if you objectively compare the two, you'll see that the 1980s fundamental background is weaker than that of the 1950s and early 60s. Why is this important? Because it's going to get down to the final point of why a fifth wave brings you the largest correction since the entire sequence began. Its, its engine, for the most part, is psychology. People are saying things are improving. OK, maybe they're not as good as they were once before, but I'm going to put my little blinders on, and I'm not going to worry about it. We're going to try to recreate the glory of the, those wave three days, but even if we can't quite achieve it, we're going to try, we're going to get there. This is based on hope. This is not based on the actual reality of the background fundamentals. That's why prices get so extremely overvalued when a fifth wave occurs on a major trend basis. And of course, if you've looked at any of the charts of prices relative to earnings, prices relative to dividends, or prices relative to book value uh, in August of 1987, you saw that you had to go back to 1929 to find a configuration indicating an equal overvaluation. All right, we discussed three rules of the wave principle. <clears throat> now I'm going to discuss three guidelines. What's the difference between a rule and a guideline? Very simply, a rule is, is something 
that describes market behavior in such a way that there are no exceptions. A guideline gives you a suggestion of what is most likely to happen, but does not guarantee that a formation or pattern will work out in a specific way. Nevertheless, these guidelines are so important and so valuable, they really are the key to good performance in the market. They're the key to the track record that the Elliott Wave Theorist has uh, generated over the past 10 years. They're the key to how well Hamilton Bolton did from the 1950s into the 1960s, and so on. So these are the next most important things to learn about the wave principle if you want to apply it yourself. The first one I'd like to bring to your attention is called the guideline of equality. After observing hundreds of charts of stock prices, Elliott came to another observation. He said, when the third wave is the longest, it is usually the case that waves 1 and 5 are approximately equal in terms of price movement and the amount of time it takes to unfold. I'm going to refer to the Dow Industrial Average chart just to give you an example of what he meant. All of the charts we'll be looking at during these two days are going to reflect these guidelines, but it's sometimes easier to see these things visually. Look at the subdivisions of wave three itself from 1942 to 1966. You'll notice that wave one, which is marked with a circle, and wave five, which is the movement between circle four and five, are much more equivalent in terms of time length and percentage price gain than this longer movement for circle wave three, which occurs between two and three. There is a substantial difference between the two, between wave three and, on the other hand, waves one and five, which tend toward equality. All right. The next guideline I consider the most important. It's called alternation. It says very simply that if wave two takes a simple, sharp movement against the trend, then wave four will take a complex sideways shape against the trend. Going back to these pictures of corrective patterns, if one of the two corrections, let's say wave two, moves sharply against the trend, such as this pattern does, or even as this pattern does, the next correction, or wave four, is likely to look more sideways. And very often, wave four will make a new high within the corrective pattern. Of course, the opposite is true as well. If wave two takes the sideways shape, then wave four will be the sharper movement against the trend and contain no new high. Is there an example on this Dow Industrial Average chart? Well, let's look at wave two from 1937 to 1942. You notice that it is moving sharply against the trend. It was a 50% wipeout in a matter of five years. No new high occurs within this corrective pattern. Therefore, once wave three was over, you could have assumed wave four would take a sideways shape. In fact, A.J. Frost, in writing in the Bank Credit Analyst Supplement of 1970, said exactly that. And sure enough, that's just what we got, a complex sideways movement in January of 1973, the Dow Industrial Average actually hit a new all-time high as part of the correction. Ironically, that was just before the smash of 73.4, and the sideways period ended finally out there in 1982. That is a classic uh, representation of the idea of alternation. The third guideline I want to bring to your attention answers the question how far will a correction carry? Stated alternately, at what level will a correction end? 
And this particular guideline has been responsible for some of the best Elliott Wave calls made by any of the people following this approach. And I want you to understand it because you can use it over and over and over. If you could know once a bear market started where it was likely to end, you would know more than most of the people watching the chart. Most of the people don't even know a bear market's in force, much less where it's going to end. Let's find out. Elliot stated it this way after observing hundreds of examples. He said, a correction usually finds its lowest point in the area of the fourth wave of the preceding impulse wave of the same degree. Got that? <laughs> well, so anyway, close those doors, we're going to have a quiz. <laughs> a correction usually finds its lowest point in the area of the fourth wave of the preceding impulse wave of the same degree. Now, it's one thing to hear that verbally, but it'll be very clear if we can see it on a chart. And this chart does contain a clear example of what Elliot was talking about. Let's look at wave two here again, this five-year bear market, 1937 to 1942. Once it was clearly in force, it might have been valuable to know where it would bottom. And Elliot said, well, take a look at the previous impulse wave of the same degree, which is wave one, and observe the span that the fourth wave within that movement covered. And of course, that's right here, from the three top to the four bottom. So if you look at this low, which occurred in 1942, move your eye back to the left, you will find that it occurred right in the area of the preceding fourth wave. Right in the area of the fourth wave of the preceding impulse of the same degree. Now, that's not the only example on this chart. There's another. Let's take a look at this sideways movement, which all of which is a correction from 1966 to 1982, and look at its lowest point. That was right here at the 1974 bottom made in December. Again, if you move your eye back to the left, you will find that it occurred right in the area of the previous fourth wave. That's exactly why Charles Collins said in 1966, a month off the high, this market is likely to carry into the 500s, because that is the area of the fourth wave correction which occurred in 1962. This guideline holds true, like all the others, at all degrees of trend. You'll be watching a long-term chart like this and have an idea of where a bear market lasting years might bottom. You might be looking at a real-time chart on your quote machine with five-minute bars. You can make the same observation with that. It occurs over and over and over. It is a guideline, however, not a rule which means that sometimes that, that area is not achieved or even exceeded by a slight amount. As long as the rules aren't broken, the wave structure can be valid. But this guideline is extremely helpful in identifying what the probabilities are for the end of the correction. As long as we're on this guideline, uh, let's apply it to this chart on the larger trend. If indeed we have completed from 1932 five waves up, Roman numerals one, two, three, four, and five, or have nearly completed wave five, then where is the next bear market likely to find its price low? Well, the answer would be in the area of the fourth wave of the preceding impulse of the same degree. Well, you might first make a decision that this fourth wave is the area that you would find support. And of course, the low was at 572, and the high was about 1052 on the Dow Industrial Average. Now, I would contend that that's enough risk to be out of the market until that area is achieved, or until a price pattern of bear market style, of corrective style, has been completed. However, those of you who are very observant have probably noticed 
that we have snuck a larger three marked with a Roman numeral in parentheses here at the 1929 high and put a four down here at the 1932 low, which would indicate that the entire advance from there is a fifth wave of something much larger. A.J. Frost and I made the case in our book, Elliott Wave Principle, back in 1978 that that was indeed what was going on. That even though we hadn't seen the 80s bull market yet, when we saw it, it would not only end a five-wave structure upward from 1932, but likely one that had been going on for 200 years. Let's take a look at the bigger picture. Here. Now, one of the most amazing conclusions that R.N. Elliott made with limited data was exactly that, that the late 1920s had finished a third wave and that the ensuing drop was a fourth. He only had stock data going back to the 1850s, late 1850s, and of course he was making his decisions on this basis in the early 1940s. He died in 1948. So all of the data that we had going into the 1970s when we wrote our book was not available to him, and yet he came to the same conclusion. Well, the reason Frost and I were able to substantiate that idea was that the foundation for the study of cycles in the 1970s created a chart of U.S. stock prices back to the founding of the Republic. They took the Dow Jones Industrial Average back as far as it would go, spliced it to the Axe Houghton Index and the Cowles Commission Index. Prior to that, from what I understand, they went back to New England town records to recreate what stock price values were all the way back to 1789. Now, it must be assumed that a good deal of this data is tentative at best. Regardless, it is remarkable how well this data reflects the five-wave structure that Elliott said is classic to all markets. Let's take a brief look at this development. Here we are in 1789, and the market is moving up in what is apparently a wave one. Did the late 1700s have that quality of a question of survival for this particular market? I'd say they certainly did. Had the colonies not won the Revolutionary War, we wouldn't be looking at a chart with the label U.S. stock prices today. So there was certainly a question of survival there. And I believe it's correct to say that wave one occurred during a period when there was a good deal of doubt and uncertainty about whether the new country would make it. <coughs> wave two then occurred, brought us into a low in 1842, had a rebound, and then another low in the late 1850s. Now, remember I said that wave two usually recreates the same style of fear that people had at the actual bottom? I'd like to read to you a quote from Harper's Magazine <clears throat> from 1847, which I believe reflects the kind of sentiment that was prevailing during this big second wave. It is a gloomy moment in the history of our country. Not in the lifetime of most men has there been so much grave and deep apprehension. Never has the future seemed so incalculable as at this time. The domestic economic situation is in chaos. Our dollar is weak throughout the world. Prices are so high as to be utterly impossible. The political cauldron seethes and bubbles with uncertainty. Russia hangs, as usual, like a cloud, dark and silent upon the horizon. It is a solemn moment of our trouble. No man can see the end. Well, people thought the Great Depression was bad. That was wave four. This is the way people felt during wave two. Now, what occurred right at the end of the second wave? It was actually a little bit late relative to usual development of fundamental events. That second wave ended in 1859, and what happened immediately thereafter? 
Civil War. Now, again, does this suggest the same kind or style of fears that occurred at the actual bottom? The Civil War was a war fought on our own soil, just like the Revolutionary War. It was a test of the Union, which was very similar to the battle or the war which created the Union in the first place. So wave two had the same style of fears or generated the same style as the actual low did. That was the base from which wave three was launched. Wave three occurred from the late 1850s all the way to 1929. And what a wave that was. The United States was the only major country in the world that sported essentially a laissez-faire economy. Taxes were virtually zero, and the production reflected that. From the Civil War right into the 1929 high, the percentage rate of gain in growth in this country was phenomenal compared to any other development. We went from essentially an agrarian society to a high-tech industrial society by the late 1920s, all during a third wave. If we had an advanced decline line for that third wave, I think once again you would see that with virtually 100% of all capital being plowed back into business and zero going to taxes, that the number of businesses that were start, started and uh, flourished relative to those that failed was probably much larger than what we've seen from 1932 to the present. <clears throat> again, we have to stress that we're not talking only about conditions. We're talking about the rate of change of conditions. How fast did things improve? Well, can we describe wave four as a surprising disappointment? I think so. If you did a poll of people in 1928 and 29 saying, how's the future look? You would have gotten a vast majority saying, are you kidding? It looks great. But by 1932, just three years later, gloom was spread across the country and people were saying, how could this possibly have happened? It was a complete shock to the financial world. Well, from there, wave five developed. Now, this is the chart we've been looking at all morning, from 1932 to the 1980s. And if you look closely, you'll see the five-wave subdivision we've been talking about. Again, wave five should be discernible from wave three as weaker, both technically and fundamentally. We've already discussed the advanced decline situation that we probably would see if we had a chart of uh, the 19th century. Uh, I think fundamentally we have the same uh, situation. Certainly conditions are better uh, than they were in the 1920s uh, today. We've had a few new developments. We've got better cars, better houses, and we've come on stream with computers. But was the rate of change of the quality of living faster from 1932 to 1987 than it was in the 19th century? I think the answer is no. And therefore, I still think that this 20th century advance is a fifth wave in a much longer sequence. Now, Frost and I only had data back to the late 1700s. We had to assume that a bear market preceded that point in prices in order to therefore come to the conclusion that five waves up had occurred. And uh, in fact, a man named Charles Kirkpatrick got a very interesting idea. He said, you know, the colonies' experience was essentially the same, or tied very closely to that of England uh, back in the 1700s. Let's take a look at what their stock market was doing, and therefore, roughly what the colonies were experiencing in terms of a market uh, prior to the formation of the United States. And that is what he spliced onto the long-term chart of U.S. stock prices. We find that there was a major high in 1720. That, of course, culminated the speculation uh, called the South Sea Bubble. There was a concurrent one in France. The crash that followed was horrendous. It wiped out close to 99% of the values that existed at the top. And yet the bear market wasn't over. There was an intervening rally phase that lasted quite a long time. And then a final wave C that, of course, brought us into very bad news, bad fundamental situation, a major war between England and the colonies. So the answer is that this five-wave structure that we decided to follow Elliott's rules and guidelines so well 
indeed was born from the ashes of a bear market, a major bear market. <clears throat> Let's take another look at this long-term picture from a slightly different perspective. This is the same series of data, although it is not a plot of nominal prices, it's a plot of inflation-adjusted stock prices, referred to as the constant dollar Dow. Now, what we have here is another measure of stock prices. It's nearly the same, but not exactly. It's a different ratio. It's stock prices not relative to dollars, but relative to the value of a basket of commodities. Let's see how this developed. Well, you had the same five-wave structure up to the 1830s, an ABC wave two correction right into the same price point, the same point for a 1929 high for wave three. Wave four takes a slightly different corrective pattern shape, actually took the shape of a triangle ending in 1949. We'll get into what a triangle is later today. Then wave five occurred right up to the upper end of the channel in 1966. But you'll notice this chart hasn't carried to a new high because stock prices relative to commodities are not where they were in 1966. In fact, I believe that one of the messages on this chart is extremely important to our outlook from today. And that occurrence has to do with this support line, which is part of the LA wave channel of this five wave upward structure and starting in the late 1700s. Now, I didn't draw this line on the chart. The market did. I just made it visible by connecting the lows. Let's see what the history of the low end of stock valuation has been along this line. Back in the late 1700s, the lower end of this line supported stock prices during the Revolutionary War. Terribly bad news. Right here was the War of 1812. Stock prices held their lows right here in the depression of this period and the Civil War. Stock prices then went up to the upper end and came down and had their very low valuation period again in 1920-21. World War I was occurring in here. The post-war inflation and deflation, and still that line held. In other words, the worst that the world could throw at that line, it still held all the way through these many, many decades. What happened after that? The great stock market crash, the Great Depression, World War II, and this line held. What happened right there? Something new and different was occurring. Something so devastating that this 200-year support line was broken as if a hot knife had gone through butter. You don't think it was Jimmy Carter, do you? <laughs> well, actually, I don't think it was Jimmy Carter, but something was going on in the late 1970s that presented the worst fundamental situation in the history of this country. If it brought stock prices down to a valuation level which was lower relative to the long-term uptrend line than any time in the previous 180 years, what could it possibly have been and what does it mean? Well, I think it has a lot to do with the market discounting some very bad events in the area of the global debt situation. The inflation of the 1970s was not only bad because it was an inflationary period, but because it was debt-based and continues to be so. And as we enter deflation, that is going to be a huge problem uh, for not only the debtors, but the creditors, and that includes individuals, corporations, uh, and governments around the world. Regardless of whether you believe that's a reason, we do have the evidence that something changed, something for the negative. Now, what was interesting was back in 1982 when this market made its low, it was calling for an advance, just like the nominal dollar chart that we've been looking at. The nominal dollar chart said we need a fifth wave to new all-time highs. This chart said, hey, we've done A down of an ABC correction. We need some kind of solid upward movement for wave B. 
What does it call for now? Well, currently, our stock price chart says we need a bear market. We've probably completed five waves up at least back to 1932 and maybe longer. We need a major decline. What is this chart saying? It's also saying we need a major decline because we haven't finished the bear market pattern, the wave C pattern. Uh, someone said, and it's a reasonable question, uh, the previous fourth wave on the constant dollar chart isn't that much lower than wave A. If wave C comes down, it should bottom uh, somewhere in this range of the triangle, which is the lowest point being the 1932 low, and of course the apex being 1949. Uh, there is easily a way that the, that the nominal Dow Jones Industrial Average can fall from somewhere near 3,000 down to below uh, or down near 300 or lower and have the constant dollar chart fall only to this area. And that is if we go into a severe across the board deflation so that the prices of commodities are falling almost as fast as the prices of stocks. Because that's what this chart is. It's a ratio of stock values to commodity values. So this chart I fully expect to show declining prices at a much slower rate because commodities should be falling also. The last time this happened was 1929 to 1933. Now I think a reasonable question might be, where is the next or the current major bear market likely to bottom? You may have noticed that I haven't been doing a whole lot of television lately. That's because I don't want to answer this question. If we've had five waves up from the late 1700s right into a high here in the 1980s, how much risk does this market hold? You already know what the likelihood is, what the probability is. Where should the correction eventually find its lowest price point? The answer is somewhere in the area of the fourth wave of the preceding five wave movement of the same degree. And of course, that is in this range. The low is 41 and the high is about 380. That's a long way down. Now, I'm not here to predict that the market is going to do this, but I am here to point out that Elliott observed that when a five-wave sequence of any size and duration ended according to his rules and guidelines, as long as all were followed faithfully, that the place that the ensuing bear market usually found its low was somewhere in that area. That's all we can say. However, that is a likelihood that in my opinion is so great that it is at least worth preparing for in terms of making sure you are not leveraged in the other direction. Okay, let's <clears throat> take a look at another market. We've been looking at stocks so far this morning. I'd like to take a look at a chart of gold. We're not looking at gold only because it's a different market, but because it's a commodity. And commodities have one difference in their normal wave development from that of the stock market. First, let's walk through the five wave structure, and I'll get to the difference as we approach the end of it. Back here in the late 1960s, of course, the price of gold was fixed. <coughs> Nevertheless, it had an initial run up to about $42 an ounce. Came back in 1970 to match the previous low in a wave one and two. Pessimism should match, of course, this period in terms of the ability of, price, of the price of gold to go up. And sure enough, in 1970, at least two economists were quoted widely as saying, as soon as the price controls on gold are removed, it's not going to go up. It's going to go down to $6 an ounce. Why? Because gold has no industrial value. And of course, it's an anachronism as far as money goes. Well, that set the stage for a good third wave. And gold exploded right into this peak in 1974. In March of 1974, it hit $180 an ounce. 
exceeding even the wildest expectations of the gold bugs who got on the bandwagon early and said, you want to own gold, it's going to go up. Then came wave four. Notice the alternation. This is a sharp movement against the trend. Wave four is different. It took that sideways shape, which included a new high. This new high, by the way, occurred on the last day of the year of 1974, when gold was legalized uh, in terms of ownership by Americans, a classic case of people buying in anticipation of further buying and marking the exact top by doing so. Gold then collapsed 50%. That was a surprising disappointment to the gold bugs, particularly following the legalization of gold in the United States. In fact, one prominent gold bug committed suicide right about here, so I would assume that he was quite disappointed at the time. <laughs> Actually, that's it was very unfortunate. He was a terrific analyst, and I wish he were around today. Straighten me out on some markets. In any case, once wave four was over, the fifth wave began, and this, as is typical with commodities, was the longest and strongest impulse wave in the sequence. That's the difference between commodities and stocks on the major trend when the major trend is up. Let me clarify that. The five-wave structure, the tendencies in the five-wave structure in terms of wave three generally being longer, holds true even in commodities. On the smaller degree trends, and even on major trends in parts of corrections which are heading downward. But when the trend is up, and it's a major trending market, usually it is the fifth wave which puts on the best performance. Well, is there a reason for this? After all, what we're studying here is social psychology, mass psychology. And I think the answer is yes. You see, when the stock market is creating its fifth wave, it's moving up on an emotion called hope. People are hoping things will get better, and they're willing to put more money into that market and say, around the corner, things are going to be better, prices will be higher, I'm going to take a shot at this. Hope takes a while to develop and a while to dissipate. That's why fifth waves tend not to be as powerful as the third wave in the stock market. And it's also why tops often take a bit of time, if not clearly obvious on the price chart, at least obvious in terms of the technical development of the advances and declines and so forth. Commodities are different. The fifth wave in a commodity is not propelled by hope. It's propelled by a different emotion called fear. When gold is roaring upward in this fifth wave, it's not because people are hoping the future is going to be better. Of course, there are a few guys out there hoping it will be worse. But for the most part, it is being bought by people who are fearful. They're afraid of inflation. They're afraid of what the government's going to do in reaction to it. They're afraid of the financial situation in general, and they're buying gold to protect themselves. When wheat is moving up very powerfully in a fifth wave, it is not because of hope about the future. It's because of fear, fear of crop failure, fear of drought, you name it. That's why commodities generally have a strong fifth wave. Now, let's examine this chart to help decide where the bear market, which started in January of 1980, is likely to bottom. Notice I say likely. It's not guaranteed. But until proved otherwise, until proved otherwise by a clear five-wave structure to the upside indicating an impulse wave, I say it's best to, res to withhold buying until the ultimate downside target area by the fourth wave guideline is reached. Well, the span of the previous fourth wave in this five-wave sequence is here, between $197.50 an ounce and $103.50 an ounce. That's a long way down. But that is where the wave principle suggests that the ultimate bear market low in gold will occur, somewhere in that range. And if the guideline is to be taken as it usually develops, probably nearer the lower end than the upper end. Well, this bear market, in my opinion, is still developing. The real deflationary period, as suggested by declining stock prices and declining gold prices, if we're right on these two charts, lies ahead. It is quite possible 
because bear market patterns or corrective patterns often have very strong rallies within them, that gold could see higher prices on a short-term basis. But I still think that the best interpretation is that all of this is part of a much larger bear market or corrective pattern structure. In all of the examples I've used so far, and in the examples you're going to see for the rest of today and tomorrow, none of the rules are broken. What should you do as an Elliott Wave analyst who is keeping real-time track of a market if a rule does appear to be broken? Well, there are only three, so this is pretty easy to deal with. If wave two, what you're counting as wave two, makes a new low, it's not wave two. It's something that's part of the preceding corrective pattern. The only other two rules are that wave three should not be the shortest and that wave four should not overlap wave one. Now, just for convenience, I drew a chart, a developing price pattern, which would suggest that both of these rules have been broken. And I can't tell you the number of times I have seen analysts uh, in print or otherwise say, well, look, uh, this is clearly five up, even though there's overlap and a third's too short, uh, you've got to sell this market short. But all they're doing is selling themselves and their accounts and the wave principle short, because the wave principle says this is not a five-wave structure according to the rules and guidelines of the wave principle. What should you do when you see this kind of development? How should you think? If you have taken a very close look at the wave structures and the real-time charts that we've been looking at so far, you will see that in almost every case, the resolution of this kind of early beginning is the same. Don't label this first wave, second wave, third wave, fourth wave because wave four has overlapped wave one. That four is not allowed. Even if wave four had not overlapped wave one, suppose wave five were developing, at what point could you not label that wave four and five anymore? As soon as wave five is longer than three because wave one is already longer than three, and that will make wave three the shortest. That count is wrong, then, on two major points. What is happening in almost every case is that, in truth, this is a developing third wave extension. Remember, third waves are usually the longest in a sequence. Therefore, they tend to subdivide one, two, three, four, five very clearly before they are over. And the ultimate correct labeling turns out to be that. In other words, someone had labeled this one, two, three, four, and they were trying to get a five out of here, already having broken one rule when wave four overlapped, and then another rule when wave five got too long. What? is the practical result of breaking those rules, of putting one's opinion before the wave structure. Well, what's this guy doing right here? He's selling short. He thinks the market's going to go down and correct from here. What is it actually setting up to do? Right in here, there's probably a two-day pullback that convinces him the high is in. But actually, the market is right on the threshold of the third wave of the third wave, the most powerful upward section of this entire advance. Just when he should be the most bullish, he's turning bearish because he got lazy or dishonest and didn't follow the rules. There are only three of them. And they're easy to follow if you keep them in mind. So the right thing to do is label this as a smaller one and two of a developing third wave extension pattern. That one little picture should keep you out of trouble for, of mislabeling waves virtually all the time. Now, for our upcoming exercise in wave counting, we must be sure to understand 
the primary concept of the wave principle. The one major discovery that R. N. Eliot made that changed the way people will be looking at stock charts forever. And that is that the market moves in five waves, according to the rules and guidelines we've discussed, when moving in the direction of the one larger degree, and in three waves, or some corrective pattern, which is based on the three-wave theme, when moving against the trend of one larger degree. If this is a large five-wave upward structure, then this wave, wave one, is moving in the direction of the one larger trend and therefore subdivides into five waves. This movement, which is wave two, is moving against the trend and therefore it will subdivide into three waves. This holds true right up through wave three, five waves, three waves on the pullback, five waves up. Now, you see right here, for instance, a wave four taking the three-wave shape. This is a blow-up of that correction. My question to you is, if this is an ABC correction, which is moving downward right here, how many waves should wave A subdivide into? Sometimes I hear five and sometimes I hear three. At least nobody said four. The answer is wave A subdivides into five waves. The reason is that wave A is moving in the direction of the one larger trend. This one larger trend's direction is down. The correction is a counter trend movement. We were talking about a bull market, therefore the counter trend movement is down. Wave A is moving in the direction of the one larger trend, which is also down. It will subdivide into five waves. It is incorrect to express the wave principle as five waves up and three waves down because the direction per se doesn't matter. What matters is what the direction of the one larger trend is. Then the movement movements of one smaller degree will subdivide into five waves when moving in that direction and three against. How many waves should wave B subdivide into? This now, you see, is the counter trend movement. Wave B is the correction of a declining sequence. Wave B is moving against the trend. So it subdivides into three waves or some kind of corrective pattern which is based on the three-wave theme. Wave C, of course, is moving in the direction of the one larger trend, which is down, and therefore will subdivide into five waves. That one concept is going to keep you in tune with markets when you open a chart book and say which direction are the fives moving in and which direction are the threes moving in. That in itself will give you a lot of information. Another reason I brought this up now is that we're going to come back and we're going to walk through the wave structure of a bear market. So you have to understand how the wave structure will develop in the downward direction, which is exactly the same as the way it develops in the upward direction. Let's take one glance at a bear market picture, which we all know and love. That of U.S. Treasury bonds from the 1940s. Well, this market traced out five downward waves from the 1940s right into the 1981 low in bond prices, which of course was the high in interest rates, since they're the inversion of each other. Well, let's apply, let's take a look at some of these things. Is wave three the long, longest? Yes. Uh, wave one is rather short. Wave five is certainly much shorter than wave three. Let's take a look at where a counter trend movement would likely end if we've had five waves down. Well, where should it end? We're having a correction now, but in this case it's pointing up instead of down. The guideline still holds. It should end in the area of the fourth wave of the preceding impulse. 
which is why this little fourth wave area, in my opinion, for the past several years, has stood as resistance to this corrective counter-trend rally. The long bond in approximately the 7 to 7.5% 7 area was resistance for this super bond rally that we had from 1981 to 1986. Now, you may have heard commentary to the effect that that bull market was the best bull market in the history of United States bonds. You know what? It's true. And that's pretty sad. <laughs> this is the classic and typical direction of bond prices over the years. Uh, someone somewhat feistier than I once referred to bonds as certificates of guaranteed confiscation. <laughs> now, whether that's true or not is beside the point, but they don't make great long-term investments. They make great trades upon occasion. I would say that as long as this resistance area is not penetrated significantly on the upside, this picture should be viewed as long-term bearish. The five-wave structure has defined the major trend, the one larger trend, as down. The ABC structure of the rally has defined that as the counter-trend direction. So it tells you that on the very long term, the trend of bonds is down, the trend of interest rates is up. If you have trouble visually adjusting to the idea that we can have five down and three up, just do this. You see, it's the same structure. You get five in the direction of the one larger trend and three against. And of course, this is not bond prices anymore. This is long-term interest rates. We've had a bull market in interest rates peaking in 81. We had a bear market that probably ended in 1986. It could make another low in this resistance area. We didn't penetrate it. But nevertheless, we have done all we had to do to correct that great five-wave upward move lasting almost 40 years in interest rates. I'm often asked how these structures can continue to develop over the very long term. People say, look, Bob, you're telling me that the 1980s bull market in stocks is somehow related to this bull market of the 1930s, when all of the people who were participating in the market back then, or most of them certainly, have long since passed away. Certainly, even if they're around now, they're not trading like they were back then. How can you tell me that something that these speculators did back 50 years ago has anything whatsoever to do with what's going on in the 1980s? Well, let's forget the empirical side of it first, Elliot's observation that they do, and therefore you've got to deal with that rather than just trying to deny the fact that it happens, and try to, to figure out why events that occurred years or decades or perhaps even centuries ago have anything to do with what's going on today. Well, I used to try to give an explanation that referred to the way uh, cultural values are transmitted over a period of time, but I never could formulate an answer as eloquently as a sports writer could. So. I'm going to read a few paragraphs from one of the great sports writers and see if we can get some insight into the answer to this question from his observations on the aftermath of a football game. This happened to be an article that came out in November of 1984 describing what happened after the Florida Gators won the Southeastern Conference Football Championship for the first time in the history of that university. Now, for the moment, we won't discuss all the ramifications of what developed afterwards. Just suffice it to understand that for 50 years, this football team, or let's say this university, had participated in the Southeast Conference, the SEC, and had never once won the title. And this year, they did. And here's how it was described. And when the scoreboard clock struck zero, five decades of frustration burst into five minutes of glorious joy. 
Gerald Wilkins, a reserve linebacker, sprinted to midfield, flung himself to the turf, and writhed in ecstasy. Elaine Hall, the coach's wife, leaped to kiss Lomas Brown, the offensive tackle, on the cheek. On the chilled sideline, Alonzo Johnson bent at the waist and clutched his belly with his hands, trying to hold the moment inside. When he straightened up, it was clear he'd failed. The rough, tough Florida linebacker was crying, weeping not only for the SEC championship the Gators had won, but for the 50 others they hadn't. Fittingly, it didn't come easy. To have waited 50 years and then won easily wouldn't have purged Gator souls the way Saturday's victory did. Now, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> These people are kids. They're 19, 20 years old. They've only been playing football at the university an average of two years. The people in the stands haven't gone to every game for 50 years and cried over the losses. What's happening here? This was a cultural transmission of the values of the football team to all of the fans, all of the commentators, all of the players in a very short peri period of time. Anyone involved with that university, probably in a matter of months, was fully indoctrinated with the history of the University of Florida's football team. They incorporated and assimilated all of that information to a gut emotional feeling that spilled out as if they had personally lost every one of those championships until that year. Now, I think in the same way, transmissions of all kinds of cultural values take place over the years, over the decades, and even over the centuries. How could we have had the 1930s if we hadn't had the exuberance of the 1920s? How could we have had the rebuilding of the 1950s if we hadn't gone through World War II? And certainly, how could we have had the ebullient, crazy 1960s if for a decade or more people hadn't built very conservatively and very powerfully, year after year, a reserve big enough to begin throwing a nice party? How could we have had the 1970s, the reactionary 70s, if we hadn't overdone it in the 60s? And how could we have experienced the bootstrap psychology of the 1980s? Let's get ourselves back in shape everywhere from government to personal jogging if we hadn't gone through the 70s, which most people considered a negative psychological period. I say we couldn't have, that each change is born from the preceding conditions and is ready to generate the next change. The market acts the same way. Now, just as valid, I think, is the question, okay, maybe I'm convinced that this kind of thing could happen over the long term, but you're also telling me that on the short term, you're seeing the same structures. That if I'm looking at a three-year bull market that takes a five-wave shape, the intermediate term advance of wave one is taking a five-wave shape, and wave one of that took a five-wave shape, and wave one of that, and so forth, all the way down to things I can barely measure. Well, my answer to that is, so far, there has been absolutely no evidence to indicate otherwise. Does mass psychology really operate at the level to create five up and three down, or five down and three up in a correction on, say, a, a matter of a few hours? The answer is yes. We've been watching quote machines now for several years, which give you tick-by-tick tick data. You can make five-minute bars, 15-minute bars, and 30-minute bars, and sure enough, the Elliott Wave pattern continues to show up. <coughs> Here's an example of one. This is a chart from September 1987, actually August 1987, of the major market index of stocks, referred to as the maxi. It so happens that there's a story to this. This was uh, utilized in real time to make some money. Uh, when this came up on the chart, someone said, have you noticed this very pretty five-wave upward structure that we've just created over the last couple of hours? What should we do? Well, we want to buy something because this five-wave structure is indicating the larger trend is up. We've been in a larger correction pr prior to that. Where would you place an order to buy a futures contract on the maxi? Somewhere in the area of the previous fourth wave, right? And of course, this is the lower boundary. 
which means, according to the guideline, it would be very rare for prices to go under that level if indeed a new impulsive wave structure was unfolding. So they put their order in to buy at the lower end of the fourth wave because they wanted to keep risk low. If they didn't get it, that's fine. If they got it, they had their stop in right there, just below the low point of wave four. And here is the way prices ended the day. The order was filled right here at the low on a spike, which is undoubtedly was a lot of uh, stops being taken out at the last minute. No stop was taken out because it didn't go below the fourth wave, and stocks immediately turned around and went to a new high for the day. So you don't have to look at a 50-year chart and wait a decade or so for your forecast to work out. You can apply exactly the same rules and exactly the same guidelines to any degree of development of prices. It, one of the best ways to learn the wave principle is to watch the development of these structures on the very short term because you'll learn a lot of lessons in a short period of time. You'll see a lot of five wave structures develop, a lot of corrective waves develop, a lot of pullbacks to the previous fourth wave, a lot of times when five is about the same length as one or if not it'll be a Fibonacci relationship and on and on. You'll see alternation occurring very often. When we come back we're going to apply the rules and guidelines we've just explored. And we're going to take a big step forward. We're not going to just talk about counting to five. We're actually going to do it. Thank you. <laughs>